Rory, welcome. Uh, it's so lovely to have you with us today. Um, and I'm also joined by uh, the incredible Louise, who may or may not actually be interviewing Rory at Nudstop this year. So this is a, a, a sort of a small taste of, uh, of something that you may see at Nudstop itself. Um, but yeah, we're, we're celebrating Nudstop 10 years uh, this year, which is a remarkable feat. So bravo, Rory. Um, and we just thought this conversation will just go into a little bit about how it started and, uh, and really what people have to look forward to this year. Uh, so yeah, so if you want to... Absolutely superb. <laughs> Is there a very quick evolution that you can share, Rory, with us, uh, and, then, uh, and then maybe a little taste of what's, what's coming up? Well, um, evolution, interesting question. Um, well, it's first of all our 10th anniversary, and we think we've reached a point now, after 10 years, where we can break a rule which was occasionally breached in the past, uh, where we can invite a few people back. Uh, and so we'll be starting to do that a little bit more. Um, but what we have is, I hope, is enough that at any sector you're in, most of the talks will be relevant. And... Uh, right. We also, at the same time, cover what is a fairly broad definition of behavioural science. You know, I, don't get me wrong, I think that there are some areas of behavioural science which are much more important than others. I think choice architecture is a very, very important and still very, very robust finding uh, which needs to be given far more prominence, perhaps. And that's one of the reasons why we've got, for example, Paco Underhill, uh, who's the great... Um, uh, author of uh, the New York Times bestseller, Why We Buy. Uh, we've also got what you might call the Don of Choice Architecture, uh, which is Eric Johnson, um, who is uh, at Columbia Business School at Columbia University. Um, but um, it's a, you know, it, it's a gloriously, I think, broad area, which is it won't, like many academic conferences, become monotonous through over-focus on the same things. And it would be inexcusable in a field as rich as behavioural science if we were to do this. But equally, I think we've kept it grounded enough so that it's a very healthy mixture. And I make no apology for this of, you know, fairly high end research, which is still awaiting practical application. But at the same time, we also have a very, very good mixture of theoreticians and practitioners. Uh, Mayor Shanker, for example, uh, the cognitive science, uh, scientist, is the senior director of behavioural economics at Google. You know, you don't get much bigger than that in the applied behavioural science field. Um, uh, we also have, um, for example, Shalina Jan Mohammed, who's who's one of our um, local uh, voices, uh, who's an Ogilvy uh, colleague of mine, uh, who's uh, a, a, perhaps the world's leading expert on understanding and engaging with uh, Muslim consumers. So, um, Louise has the book. We cover the waterfront, <laughs> put it that way. <laughs> it's, I love as well that um, what I always find brilliant about Nudge Stock is it's this this beautiful combination of, well, it's, firstly, it's very accessible, very enjoyable, but it's always a beautiful combination of behavioral science and creativity. Yes. Um, and I think that the two go very well together, and I think you're uniquely placed to uh, to provide that. I think, I think it's absolutely vital to understand that behavioural science is not a prescriptive science. It doesn't tell you what to do, it tells you where to look. And its principal value, which is why, by the way, it's not always popular, okay, or it's not always welcomed, but it expands the possible solution space. And it means that there are 10 places to look rather than two. And economics has typically given you sort of two places to look in the field of incentives. You either bribe people for doing something or you fine them for not doing something. And it tends to narrow the field of inquiry. Now, of course, in business decision making or institutional or political decision making, that very narrowness is often bizarrely popular. Because if you can claim, here I stand, I can do no other, OK, because the model tells me I have to do this, then you may not be making a very good decision, but you are fairly safe from blame. If you can pretend that what you are doing, the model told me to do it, is the 21st century equivalent of I was only following orders in the, in the 20th century. OK, <laughs> but at the same time, the principal value is it massively widens the scope for creative and inventive inquiry. And I think, I think, I think, you know, you can't separate it from creativity. I don't think it tells you what to do. 
I think it tells you where to where to look and it tells you uh, what you know uh, which perhaps un normally unexplored avenues might be worth actually exploring in this case. Great whilst you're talking about diversity of thought Rory that one of your guests is Matthew Said and his great talk about it's not just a collection of brilliance but we have to have all diverse voices in the room. A br brilliant people are surprisingly prone to, I think, a cognitive failing we all have, which is once we make sense of something to our own satisfaction, we stop asking questions and we stop looking. And so a, a group of, as Matthew Sion's wonderful work in the book Rebel Ideas shows, um, a group of highly intelligent, you know, high IQ, but cognitively very similar people are hugely prone to two things, one of which is massive blind spots, because there will be aspects of the problem they simply do not see, wedded as they are to a particular sort of model that, that gives them essentially legibility of the problem. OK, um, they're also, I think, disproportionately prone that when you fail, you simply double down on your failures. And those, I think, are two qualities of groups which are not cognitively or otherwise diverse. I mean, diversity of background, diversity of ethnicity, diversity of gender. I mean, they're all part of a much wider and more important um, uh, aspect, which is, you know, diversity of opinion, if you like. I mean, I was I was, you know, I, I was pleased. I don't necessarily agree with the guy, but I thought the uh, interesting view from the uh, HSBC uh, environmental spokesman by dint of being different, was important. Because I don't think in real world situations we can ever be completely right or completely wrong, by the way. You know, OK, that exists in what are laughably called the hard sciences, which are, of course, in some respects, easy, um, because there is a single right answer. I think that the attempt to um, obtain scientific certainties in anything involving human behaviour or other complex systems, markets, ecosystems for example um, I think the um, I, I think the need to, to believe oneself completely right uh, is actually a very very dangerous mental um, failing uh, to actually apply to any of those instances of systems which simply defy easy quantification and you were saying Rory that it's this great mix of sort of established writers and then uh, research papers and of course you've got Rob Henderson who's an American psychologist but also is a studying PhD and his talk sounds like it's going to be very interesting he's interested in luxury <coughs> beliefs. L luxury beliefs and Rob's interesting because he grew up in a series of orphanages in pretty tough circumstances in Los Angeles and um, uh, what is interesting is that I think he has the capacity, Paul Dolan is another such person, um, who has the capacity to look at what you might call the uh, self-appointed middle class intelligentsia with an outsider's view. And quite a lot of what emerges might be said to be beliefs that are held not because they solve a problem, but because they what they say about the person who holds them. And I think there is a, a, an area where there are beliefs which are almost a form of costly signalling. You know, I believe this because I can afford to. Not like those skint people who are threatened by these things. I am, of course, above such concerns and therefore can actually signal my status um, by holding, uh, you know, beliefs which, to be honest, probably don't hold up much to empirical uh, reality. But that's not the point. And I think Rob's uh, uh, Rob's healthy uh, scepticism towards those opinions is incredibly valuable, and he's um, you know brilliantly placed actually to spot things. It's rather like you know who they, whoever discovered water, it sure as hell wasn't a fish. And I think I think many of us, and particularly if you look at very homogeneous uh, industries like marketing, which historically tended to employ from quite a narrow category of personality. I'm not talking there necessarily about gender or ethnicity, but that, you know, uh, <coughs> all, all marketers, for example, are characterised by being very high on the openness scale and therefore 
tend to either dismiss or fail to comprehend uh, what you might call more conservative points of view. There, there is a very large swathe of the population, by the way, who doesn't want anything to change. OK, their basic mentality is, you know, I'm fairly content where things are. I know what I'm doing. You know, I can survive. Can you please leave things alone? Now, to a marketer, that mindset, maybe when they get to 70 or 80, they, they, they actually hit that mindset a little bit. But to a young marketer, such a mental approach to the world, which is held by huge swathes of the population, is pretty much, you know, incomprehensible. And so, yeah, I think I think this this question of, of cognitive diversity, you also get some really interesting surprises. I think it's notable that people, for example, there's a fine line between OCD and creativity. And, you know, you might ask the question, how healthy is it that we're effectively medicating creativity? OK, <laughs> right. But also, I, I'd argue that there are some very interesting findings so that people who are slightly on the autism spectrum okay uh, make very good social scientists because things that are instinctive to to the neurotypical actually have to be understood by people who aren't neurotypical so as a result they work things out from first principles in a way that most people don't and that gives them actually a heightened understanding of human social interaction rather than as you may assume a kind of weakened one it's probably why in, in advertising you see a lot of sort of rare to be neurodiverse people and there's a lot of a lot of dyslexic creatives out there uh, that's i mean the collection with dyslexia and entrepreneurialism for example has to be you know has to be investigated more because you know it may be a question of what you focus on it may be a question of having some sort of sight that others lack don't know but it's cert it, it certainly in some cases it must be statistically significant at one stage, I think the majority of people on the board of Tesco, and this is at the height of their success, were actually dyslexic. Yes, I've always seen it as a as as as, as, a, as overwhelmingly in my life a benefit. Apart from when I was at school, I think if you have to deal with yeah. rigid structures, it it, it's, it, it makes the, life really the, challenging for you. But it's, this actually leads yeah. to a much. A, a, a much overlooked question, which is we may be focusing, we may be doing the wrong thing right rather than the right thing wrong. OK, I think that's a Peter Drucker mm -hmm. quote, and it's much better to do the right thing wrong than the wrong thing right. But an awful lot of business is actually focused on optimising, uh, you know, something which shouldn't be optimised in the first place. OK, and one of the questions I'd raise there is about um, equality of opportunity. OK, which without necessarily us noticing comes to imply two things okay equality of opportunity one that life should naturally be hierarchical and all that matters is that the right people get to the top so it's kind of dismissive of the idea of greater egalitarianism i would argue because it's all about you know we, we're going to have winners and losers here guys but the vital thing is that the, you know the people who win can then lay claim to being uh, deserving of their position which then creates, by the way, the, 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 the follow-on problem that they become self-entitled and uh, completely unconscious of the role of luck and fortune in their position. OK, but the second thing is we probably should actually be trying to design a world that's focused on diversity of opportunity, plurality of opportunity, not equality of opportunity. Equality of opportunity suggests you have to apply the same criteria to everybody and then rank them. I don't think that's a great, I don't think, you know, I don't, you know, there will always be some degree of status and hierarchy. One of the interesting things about the business world, in fairness to the business world, unlike, say, politics or academia, is it provides you with quite a lot of ways to feel successful. You know, you can have a guy who starts a scaffolding firm can make a hell of a lot more money than someone who f starts a law firm. That's that's not a bug. That's a feature, in my opinion. Yeah, that's brilliant. I know. Um, I know we've gone uh, uh, as as with all our conversations, we always go slightly uh, off topic, which is uh, I love going the countryside route. Um, but uh, I guess we should go back to nudge talk. <laughs> what's the um, what's the are there any speakers that you're really really looking forward to this? Sylvia year? Pan is kind of uh, one of the gods of uh, VR and um, uh, augmented reality. Uh, she's at uh, Goldsmiths. Um, and uh, uh, she's a computer scientist and I suppose as everybody is in VR a kind of phenomenologist 
Um, obviously, I'm uh, looking forward to um, uh, Jez Groom, who's my former partner and co-founder of the Behavioural Science Practice, who no longer works with us, but is coming back to mark the 10th year of, of Nudgestock. Um, uh, we have some fascinating speakers. Uh, for example, uh, uh, Jamie Hamill uh, is uh, utterly fascinating, um, uh, specialising in sustainability strategy and creative thinking. And uh, uh, that's that's an absolutely tremendous person. And um, uh, for those of you, you know, someone who's uh, uh, fairly much a, a, a celebrity um, in the, uh, you know, Dan Pink, obviously. How could one not be? In fact, it's bizarre that we've never had Dan Pink in the previous nine years of our existence. Well, now we have. I don't think he needs much introduction. And of course, um, from the Wharton School, there's Katie Milkman. And um, Katie uh, had a very, very good reason for not speaking last year, which is she was exclusively dedicated to pandemic questions, uh, both last year and the year before. But we now have uh, enough, uh, you know, uh, new, less virulent strains, perhaps, or less um, uh, less uh, painful strains of COVID uh, give us the opportunity to um, uh, to invite Katie this year, which is absolutely tremendous. Uh, she's um, uh, she's the host of Charles Schwab's Behavioral Economics podcast, Choiceology. And um, uh, again, uh, one of those many interestingly behavioural scientists who's migrated to the business school in their university as well, which I think is perhaps indicative that um, its natural home is among what you might call the, the natural the natural place for behavioural science is what David Ogilvy always wanted for the ad agency, which is he hated it when people referred to Ogilvy as the University of Advertising, because he said it made it sound kind of theoretical and academic. And he preferred to think of it as the teaching hospital of advertising, which is a place which both practices and conducts research and where where the, each of those two components complements the other. And um, so I love that you've got your your Ogilvy braces on today, Rory, yeah. as well. No, they should be mandatory <laughs> in my opinion. But I, I'm one. Of, I'm one of the last few people who uh, I'm a bit of a fan. To be honest, it's not entirely branding. It's also that I'm a big fan as a fat man. I'm also a big fan of high waisted trousers. So uh, there's more going on. We there. gave we gave red braces to everyone in the Ogilvy Cape Town office uh, when I was when I was there. It's uh, it's great fun. Yeah, the only <laughs> downside is occasionally you get an American presenting and they say, "I remember David Ogilvy standing there in his red suspenders," and all the British people are going, <laughs> "God, that's an image I can't get out of my head." Okay, that's something I wish I could unsee, right? But apart from calling them red suspenders, which is alarming, yeah, I, I, I'm all in favour of them. And you were mentioning. Just for any Americans watching, uh, suspenders uh, in Britain means what you call a garter belt. OK, that's why we find it disturbing. <laughs> you were mentioning Katie there and um, what Katie Milkman has so brilliantly done. Everybody's very disparaging of pop science, but she's so brilliantly bought that, brought her subject in the book How to Change out of the lab, as so many behavioural scientists have successfully done this year, and into sort of the popular conversation, hasn't she, Rory? Uh, absolutely that, and actually, this is a lovely discipline. I make no, I mean, okay, if you're a purist, you would regard the fact that this is an area of discipline which has spawned airport literature, um, including my own, I might add. Okay, you would regard that as a, a as you know, something to criticise it for. I absolutely disagree because I think that the, um, the the best thing we can do, the second best thing we can do with behavioural science is practice it. The best thing and the most valuable thing we can do is actually disseminate it. If it simply means, even if, to be honest, a slight misunderstanding of the literature causes someone to consider or attempt something they otherwise wouldn't have tried... Uh, then I'd argue that, you know, the effect is probably net positive under the right testing circumstances. I'm not talking necessarily about medical testing, but you get my point, OK? Uh, if it actually just broadens people's broadens people's conception of what value might mean, OK? Um, that's, uh, that's doing a public service, in my opinion. And, and just uh, very quickly, because I know we're running out of time, uh, we... <laughs> We've got uh, a... Is, it, is, is, your, is your washing machine going into the spin cycle there, Chris? No, not, not me. Okay, <laughs> there's something in the background. I was just wondering, yeah, I just thought... Um, I, I like it. I think it's verite. I think it's authentic. So don't worry about it. 
<laughs> Somebody's washing machines hitting the spin cycle. A, a, a tour of Louise's house. Uh, but, uh, we've got a uh, one of the things that uh, that we've created uh, with with Louise and your help and your team's help is uh, we if, if anyone's listening and they want to uh, to to prime themselves for nudge stock this year. We've actually created a, uh, a money can't buy totally free nudge stock course. Uh, so if you go to 42courses.com, you'll see that there is a nudge stock course there that looks back at the best talks over the last 10 years. Um, and there's a lovely introduction um, from yourself. Is, is, isn't well, that, so isn't that by the way, fantastic uh, in the extent to which, I mean, okay. If you if you consider the Brexit debate where there was absolute paranoia about the free movement of goods if you impose small tariffs, okay. Yet let's ask a bigger question, okay, and let's be optimistic. What really matters actually in enriching humanity is the movement of ideas, not the movement of goods. The great thing about the movement of, of ideas is that uh, it isn't a kind of zero sum game, uh, you know. And great thing is, you know, ideas in and of themselves don't use up much, don't create much carbon, right? And so, you know, one of the things that strikes me as bizarre is the same people who were, uh, you know, gutted by, uh, you know, small tariffs on the movement of goods should be correspondingly really excited by Zoom and video conferencing and online courses like your own, which have suddenly inordinately increased the free flow of ideas, but also done something equally, perhaps more important, which is completely removed what was invisible geographical discrimination. And this is what we discovered when we took yeah. Nudge Stock online, OK? If you hold a course in London, a one-day course in London, OK, that course might cost 400 quid for Londoners to attend. If you live in Glasgow, it costs you 1,500. And if you live in Cape Town, it costs you four grand. OK? Yeah. Now, and if you, know, if you live in rural Botswana, well, you ain't going, right? <laughs> OK? Now, that extraordinary, you know, uh, asymmetry of availability... You know, I attended during lockdown a course on insect epidemiology, which was hosted by Duke University in North Carolina. And midway through the conference, I remember myself thinking, if I'd gone to the finance department and said, I need a return flight to Raleigh, Durham, um, to attend a course on insect epidemiology, you know, I think I would have got fairly short shrift, to be absolutely honest. Um, but, but here we are, you know. And actually, the rewards to the curious now and particularly to the curious and remote in other words people who happen not to live in a mega city and you know i'm talking about birmingham i'm not I'm, you know i'm not necessarily talking about you know uh, you, you know kiribati or some obscure atoll in the pacific ocean i mean although it equally applies to them that effective complete evenness if you take okay time zone is a little bit of a question but that extraordinary egalitarianism of access is something we should really be celebrating much more than we, we have done. Yeah, so it's incredible. I'm really looking forward to where this goes in the future. I know that we've kind of run out of time, but I, I had one uh, final silly question uh, that we've started to ask everyone when they come on these podcasts. Uh, so <laughs> my question to you, Rory, is would you rather live in a world where you always had to dance instead of walking, or would you rather live in a world where you always have to sing instead of talking? Um, sing. I, 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 I'm not a natural dancer and find it, you know, it's a bit like, it's, it's a bit like uh, Dr. Johnson on sex. The pleasure is momentary and the position ridiculous. Um, so yes, I, I, I would probably end up, to be honest, falling back on a form of plain song, uh, rather than something necessarily more tuneful, but yes, uh, singing rather than speaking, uh, would be a preferable, uh, you know, trade-off to dancing rather than walking. I'd quite like to hear a rapping Rory Sutherland. Yeah, uh, well, I think, I think I, you know, I mean, I, I, I think that's where I'd have to go. Um, yeah. <laughs> thank you so much. And thank you, Louise, for joining as well. I know um, you're going to have a, a lovely chat with Rory as well at Nudstock, looking back at the, at the 10 years. So, uh Look, if anyone uh, needs to sign up for Nudstock, good news is uh, just you just need to go to nudstock.com uh, and the sign up is uh, is absolutely free. Um, and it's uh, it's it's uh, yeah, you, you'd be silly to miss out on it. <laughs> it's going to be an incredible event. Um, but yeah, Rory, thank you so much for joining. And um, Louise, thank, thank you. you. As ever, a pleasure. And I know, of course, not I know, of course, not to close the tab until the upload is complete. <laughs> cool. Thank you so much. Cheers.